Hey everyone, it is Timogen from Alone Season 9. Today we are talking about episode 2. This is part 2 of our recap, so if you haven't seen the episode, don't watch this. These are riddled with spoilers. But if you want to know more about my drop date, which was on uh, episode 2, along with Terry's drop date, uh, check out part 1 of this uh, video series. I'll put the links right up here. Today we are focusing on Adam, Tom, and Jacques. And some of the topics that we'll, we'll be discussing is shelter builds, fire procurement, and also fishing, hunting, and one of the most important things, your psychological mindset and how to keep clear on your purpose of being out there and how that changes over time. So let's get into it. Welcome, and if this is the first time you're seeing me, my name is Dr. Tan. I am one of the 10 contestants from season nine of Alone. And one of the interesting things about my perspective on the season is that I'm a doctor, former soldier, specialized in cold weather warfare and survival. And what I love doing is giving you a medical perspective on our journey out there in that long-term survival situation. So if you like that type of stuff, click the subscribe and notification bell, and let me know what kind of medical things pop into your head while I'm talking, going over everyone's experiences. And please let me know if I miss something that you picked up on or something that you want more details on number one you can check it out on my previous videos or number two just let me know in the comments i might make a dedicated video for you if it's a topic that everyone wants to know more about so first off we have adam and one thing that is incredibly impressive is how fast his shelter gets put up on tv now one thing to realize is we don't know what the timeline truly is we know it's within two weeks but just knowing Adam personally, there's a lot that get missed in the show. So it was really cool to see him put up a shelter, but he may have been hunting, he may have been catching fish and that type of thing in the meantime. But it sounds like the story that's being told for this episode is highlighting his shelter, which is a beautiful build. Now, Adam is the only one this season that brought an additional tarp. This is an interesting choice because for those of you who don't know Adam personally or his backstory, he spent over 90 days at sea sailing across the Atlantic by himself. So. This guy knows how to be alone. My hope when he told me he was gonna bring an extra tarp is to build a boat. But the tricky thing about building a boat on the location that we are on, there are some inlets, there are some lakes on there as well. So it's kind of a hit and miss. For the most part, we're all on a river and that river moves pretty darn fast at some locations. So unless he has a decent sized anchor, that would have been really cool to see that boat build. But we've also seen in previous seasons, this does take a lot of energy. This does take a lot of effort. And with the wet and cold environments where it's chilling you to the absolute bone and you're typically some sort of damp most days, it'll be really hard to keep warm build a shelter and then build a boat at the same time so he ends up building a solid shelter and he uses his 12 by 12 foot tarp as waterproofing backups for his main shelter and also windows which is amazing because then you can see outside one thing that i thought of that may have been integrated or i'm not sure if it's going to be integrated later on is we don't really see what his fire setup is and for those of you who saw my last episode on season nine episode two part one the recap i love fire pits i love stoves just like juan pablo so one of the things that popped on my head when bringing a clear tarp is making a super shelter now the components of a super shelter we don't have all of it out there but what essentially could be done is have a fireplace outside the shelter big long fire kind of like the length of the shelter and it looked like it was about 10 to 12 feet long would be to have this big big old fire transparent front where that allows that heat to go through that uh, transparent layer and get trapped inside the shelter now the one component of a super shelter that we don't really have out there is that reflective layer that space blanket layer so if you put it on the inside of your shelter and you have that clear front side and then a fire in front of that that heat goes into the shelter and it reflects off that space blanket onto you and for the most time i've done this at minus 30 minus 40 and you barely need a wool blanket in there because you get so so toasty and if, if you do that fire right it burns for hours and hours and hours and the cool thing is you're not chopping big logs or anything like that you are just piling them on top of each other because it's a slow burn slow smolder and that reminds me of another tip for long fires so if you're using the fire for like smoking or just making sure that you have some embers one way to preserve that ember and to have that fire literally last at least 24 hours so one way to do that is to line up your wood multiple woods uh, parallel to each other like this put dirt in between them and then 
go this way, do the same thing, put multiple layers like that, put dirt in between them and just stack it up. And then on the top, that's where you place uh, your first fire. And what happens is the coal slowly eat away at the core of this structure. And because there's not a lot of air gaps, like your typical log cabin style fire, this burns and creates an ember over multiple, multiple hours. And that's great to keep your coals alive if you're doing like an outside camp stuff. Now, the only caveat is if you're doing it on the inside of your shelter, it can be pretty smoky, so it's not my first go-to. However, we've seen in past seasons, people preserving their coals, especially people who don't bring a, a fire seal slash fire rod, they want to conserve that because they have to make friction fires. So one thing that they can do to conserve that ember is after their morning fire, they just pile on ashes and dirt on top of that, and that smolders throughout the day. So you can come back and have that ember, put it in your little tinder bundle and blow it back to life. Love the structure design of Adam's shelter. Kind of reminds me of the structure seen on the AT trail, kind of like like that modified A-frame S structure with an open-ish front. And then I imagine his fireplace is going to be somewhere lower than him to get that heat up. That's how I would do it. And then we see his walls being built with uh, about a foot thick of moss and beams of wood. And yes, it compresses everything. It adds that insulation layer. And we've seen similar structures like that with log cabin style. But the fact that he's using really thick segments of moss makes it so that he's not using a lot of energy cutting down a bunch of different trees. One thing that I really, really like is how he he demonstrated the shingles with the pine boughs. So super organized. I can imagine that deferring a lot of the droplets from the rain to the tarp. And the tarp isn't the best. The one that we got issued is basically, I think it might not even be the heavy duty version at Canadian Tire. It has to be pretty tight or else if there's any puddles or pools in the tarp that can drip through pretty darn easily. So having those boughs on top can help uh, redirect uh, the rain. On the other hand, if your boughs are on the top, one thing when we think about colder climate is trapping in the air as much as possible on the inside in that roof. Just think of uh, having attics and that type of thing. So if the tarp is your first layer, number one, the condensation from you just being there coming out of the snow or the rain and having that area heat up, all that condensation goes up to that tarp and that's your first layer and it gets pretty drippy. So ideally everything would drip down, but if you leave during the day and it drips throughout the day, that can wet your sleeping bag if it wasn't covered or wet your equipment. If you have bad on the inside, it's kind of like thinking about some of our clothing choices, especially winter parkas. A lot of the fluffy stuff, the insulated parts are on the inside and then the shell is on the outside. So the insulation helps insulate all the heat that's generated on the inside of the structure or your body. And the outside prevents wind and other elements from coming inside, including water and snow. So that's my preference for cold weather types of setup multiple different layers and having that waterproof layer at the outside of it to trap in that last vapor and then in the in between that in an insulative layer so ideally about a foot foot and a half of insulation on the top really traps a lot of that heat in there. And then one thing that can be useful if you have a lot of condensation is having a layer of material, whether that's a, a stretched out t-shirt or something like that. So really if the condensation goes up, soaks up the t-shirt and it doesn't drip on anything. It's one of the reasons why for military operations in your 10 man tents, there are three layers to that tent. One that's made out of like a cotton blend that absorbs a lot of the moisture, condensation, that middle layer, and then that, that outside protective, windproof, waterproof, water resistant flap. So we don't have a clear idea of what the rest of the tarp is going to be used for. So I'm really curious about Adam's improvisations because we already see him using the grommets of that tarp as fishing rod eyelets. So that smooth metal that goes through the, the rope is great for fishing lines. So I hope they give us a close up of his fishing rod because that'd probably be a very effective way to do it. And it saves a decent amount of time because making those eyelets out of snaring wire does take some time. And I would know because I made multiple out there. But man, oh man, I am jealous of those windows. Now, if he could make like a double layered window to have that air gap, oof, you get a little picture of the outdoors and then also some sunlight, which is so important out there, especially deep in the woods. There's not much light and it can get pretty gray. On the hunting side of things, we see Adam take some shots at grouse. Now it is so tempting to take that shot. And I know some people and people who will be commenting on this would take that shot no matter what to get those calories. But losing two arrows is not a small thing. For small game, typically you would want to use blunt heads. But if you run out of that and you only have broad heads, then you have to make that choice to do that. And if you lose a broad head, that's one less shot on a bear. So that's a really scary thing. And for the most part, people train on shooting things on a very horizontal plane. And the only kind of adjustments we typically do is at distance, you know, whether 
arcing it up or aiming a little lower if you're super close. A lot of people don't have a great deal of practice shooting up at a tree at that angle. And the flight trajectory can change so drastically if it just touches a leaf or a little branch, and then it's enough to miss your target. One thing that you can do, like Clay mentions in his review video, is to make sure that when you're angling and taking that shot that there's some kind of backdrop whether that's the tree itself instead of going here off the branch and trying to get that bird off you would walk this way so the tree trunks over here and you would shoot so that if uh, it does miss it hits the tree and then hopefully falls to the ground if not you are climbing for it or cutting that tree down but if you cut that tree down there's a potential where that tree lands on your arrow and it breaks anyways so you might need to climb it safely another thing that we see on this episodes are different types of arrow fletchings flufus are the fluffy feathers on arrows they're about that wide compared to to the typical plastic or turkey fletchings which are, are that wide and it causes a lot of drag so if you miss it doesn't go super far it's meant for close range shots small game that type of thing and for the majority of all our shots for small game it's within 15 yard 15 meter distance and i would say for me personally i've been only taking shots within that 10 to 12 feet distance so you got to be really keen on sneaking up or ambushing your prey. One thing that I thought of in retrospect, I was talking to my neighbor about uh, hunting when I got back, was uh, he had something called a tracer and I didn't know what it was, but it's basically something that looks like dental floss that is attached to the end of your arrow. And when you shoot it, basically all that dental floss comes out and you can kind of follow that white line to your arrow. Now we don't have dental floss out there, but we have a ton of paracord and that paracord liner could be something used as a tracer. So you tie it, maybe put some uh, pine pitch on the base to keep it attached and have like a quick type of release knot so that once it's fired, the knot unravels. You'll be able to have a little bit of a path to your arrow. Now the one caveat is again, if it gets tugged on something and the brush there is really thick, I can alter your shot too. And another thing I hope someone does on this season is make bow fishing arrows. So just tying something at the end and making some kind of improvised receiver. So for that improvised bow fishing setup, you have your bow over here. And what you do is that you attach something on the opposite side of where your arrow rests so my rest is over here so something like this maybe a bottle something that you can wrap cordage around and attach to uh, your arrow so that when it shoots it kind of unravels like a fishing line and you're able to reel in whatever you catch but unlike some dedicated fishing arrows one thing that we don't have is barbs that stick out the other way to make sure that the arrow doesn't come out when you're pulling it back in so you might want to improvise that with some snaring wire to make sure when you tug on it that arrow just doesn't come out and your prey is lost to the river and it's so awesome to see adam catch those fish there's multiple different small ones that he gets and one big one and i think he cooks the small ones in a pot which i would do the same thing and he smokes the big one i think winia mentioned this as well it's easier to smoke a bigger piece versus all those individual smaller pieces now one thing that they probably don't show us do is what we do with the guts so whether that's discarded somewhere or used for deadfalls or to attract i don't know what everyone used uh, for theirs but as much as you can you want to reuse everything so if that's like a tiny little gut pile for maybe a scavenger like a muskrat on the beach that would be really really cool or birds as well like ravens and that type of thing and even though adam's eating really well and he has an awesome shelter he does talk a lot about bear and we see some bear sign on his site now he messes with the feces with his hands i wouldn't recommend that because we don't have soap out there or any kind of hand sanitizers and there can be bacteria whether that's from the bear itself or just bacteria in the feces from being out in the open and if that gets mixed with your face or anything like that it's pretty easy to get sick that way and to contaminate whatever you're working with so use a stick you can put your hand on top of the feces as you're moving it with a stick to kind of gauge how much heat and moisture is released by that to see how long it's been there and interestingly if you are going through bear feces and you're kind of looking at what things they're eating bear meat tastes different depending on what they're eating so if you are near a blueberry bush or a berry patch and they're eating mostly berries that meat's typically a little sweeter if they're eating rotten fish the meat's kind of rancid so you're not going to be picky out there but it is interesting to know that your meat can be extra tasty if you see a lot of berries in the scat or berry seeds next up is tom and he says something that i absolutely love now i'm not a hunter myself and i've only taken a few shots at animals in the past shot my recurve for about uh, seven to eight years but never really observed animal patterns with the tent to get that for food and tom says observation is one of the most key things and i 100 percent agree looking at the different animals we 
we have there. We have little carnivores, we have scavengers, we have squirrels, we have fish, and all of these animals, depending on the time of day, the weather patterns, the temperatures, things that are floating in the river, the clarity of the water, all those things are observations that you have to keep mental notes of because as soon as you start honing in those behaviors, you're wasting less and less time doing things that you know may not procure food. So fishing one right after a rain or during a rain when everything's muddled and the fish can't see anything that on the water may not be the best time or when it's super cold and a snowstorm if there's no animal noises out there and you barely see any tracks might not be the best time to go out there and actively hunt and specifically looking for any rabbit tracks or any kind of other animals that would leave a trail, including bear. Now we see Tom make a clean, clean shot uh, at a squirrel. So he cooks it in his pot and uh, makes a little bit of a soup there. And he mentions getting the bad tasting stuff out of the way, the brains, uh, the eyes, the tongues, that type of thing. To be honest, it tastes pretty good. I, I don't, I think it must be related to people's tastes or how hungry they are out there. But I felt like the brains of any animal I got out there was uh, a treat. Kind of tasted like buttery goodness out there and the more you use your um, pot to boil things the more fats and nutrients you get out of it and the softer the bones get too so it's uh, easier to get into the skulls of the squirrel and easier to access the spinal cord if you are roasting something uh, not only are you not necessarily cooking everything through and through if you have a little bit of meat that might be tainted you'll still get diarrhea you still get sick boiling really kills everything now, when we think about killing or purifying your water you don't have to boil it for hours and hours and hours to kill everything that you need to bacteria protozoa eggs cysts viruses in water you just need to bring it to a boil because the majority of everything that you need including viruses which i think has the highest kind of kill temperature around like 97 degrees celsius is as soon as you reach that boil you're already at 100 degrees celsius so everything past 97 degrees is already killed so from a water standpoint that's all all good and done now when you're boiling food the cool thing is that instead of having that really hard jerky from smoking or roasting your stuff is that everything's pretty soft. If you boil something for upwards of two hours, it's like buttery off the bones. And if you have some salt, ooh, it is a delicious, delicious meal. And uh, another thing that happens to the bones is it becomes more soft so you can easily snap open, suck on that bone marrow. That sounded bad, no dirty comments. But if I couldn't get all that marrow out uh, by just breaking it and sucking at the ends, I would chew on the ends of the, um, the femurs, ends of those bones and uh, break into that, eat all the cartilage because they would be more soft. And then I throw it back into the pot for my morning tea, basically. And livers, oh, such a treat. Has a pretty strong taste but rich in iron, rich in vitamins, rich in vitamin A. If and when someone takes a black bear, because you can get vitamin A poisoning if you just eat too much liver because of how concentrated it is in a bear. Another thing is the spinal cord. When you're boiling it, it's easier to kind of take the vertebrae apart and go into that uh, spinal cord area to get that fat. When everything's kind of roasted or dried, it gets pretty shrunk up and crusty and it's kind of hard to get into. And I love that Tom has wind awareness, both from hunting standpoint and also from an alert standpoint. He's always looking uh, at his six to make sure that the bear is not kind of in that area. And definitely at the beginning, every big snap or anything like that, your head turns so quick to, to see if it's a bear because you only have a moment to get your safety equipment ready and ready for that shot. Because again, being in that 20 foot to, for me, 10 foot distance from a bear is incredibly terrifying. And just to backtrack a little bit to squirrels, because um, if you're in a forest that has a lot of squirrels, that is a decent resource. And one of the best ways that I've seen people harvest squirrels are squirrel poles. So squirrel poles are poles that you create that have snare wires on it along the line of the pole. And you put that pole between two trees around eye or shoulder height. And what that does is apparently there's some psychological thing about squirrels where they have to cross these things and they have to explore these other areas of transit. And as they're going through this obstacle course of snares, they would get snared and then freak out and then fall down. So then that would leave that area open for the next squirrel to go. So if you have a bunch of different snares on this squirrel pole, first squirrel goes here, freaks out, gets caught around the belly or the neck, falls down, and then the second squirrel does the same thing. And then at the end of the day, you can have a full pole of just squirrels there. One tip that I learned from one of our survival experts out there is angling that squirrel pole. This is great between two trees. This is even better, but you don't want it too steep. So just maybe at like a 30 something degree angle to encourage them to go down that trap. 
So as you're observing the squirrels and figuring out what their favorite trees are, where their nests are, if you can incorporate those squirrel pools, that's a decent way to get some red meat. And finally, one thing that uh, everyone noticed on Tom was his multicolored hair. So cool that he used it for uh, fishing lures. He used parts of the colorful hair, parts of his colorful paracord, and then wrapped it. It looked like a little bit of white inner lining of the paracord. And what a great catch this episode. Super, super stoked to see more from Tom. And lastly, we see Jacques who just kills it again, gets squirrel and a huge fish. I think one of the bigger ones that we've seen to date. And he's just kind of thriving in regards to hunting and fishing but despite this we see him losing some belly fat which is anticipated because if we're not getting more calories than we're putting out then we're gonna have a bunch of weight loss and the first thing that the body tries to take from is your fats so you see that big old beer gut kind of go away within like two to three weeks pretty quickly the way I think about it is you're kind of going down on your reserves not a huge alarm to freak out about. And again, from what I've read before, during and after this experience, people eating as much as they can, as soon as they can, and rationing only a surplus of food that they can't eat immediately because it's too much is something preferable, especially when you still have your survival priorities to accomplish, like building your full on shelter to um, establish a good hunting trap line and to actively fish on a day to day basis. So ideally eat as much as you can. I know it's incredibly psychologically hard to not have any food as bad backup. So I get anyone who would want to like ration out some of their fish if they were in that same situation. During this episode, we get a little bit of insight into uh, Jacques' uh, history, his uh, past, and we really see him ruminate on some of his previous regrets and traumas and how he pictures his life currently. And everyone has a reason to be out here. I, I think one thing that the viewer might not get is that we're not all there for the money. It helps, it can be life-changing, but if there's something more important than the money, I have no qualms and only respect for people who choose that thing which they discover is the most important to them at that time. And as Jacques puts, he, for the first time in his life, is running towards something. And really that is the whole kind of embodiment of this experience, to take a very uncomfortable, unfamiliar situation and go head first and try your best and to improvise, adapt and overcome and to seek out what you truly want in life. And I think in his way, he was seeking out what he truly desired. And I'm so happy for him. It is really sad to see people bash him on social media, but as you saw, he did well with his skills. He did well with being out there for 15 days, which is, by the way, the longest tap for the first person on Alone History. So I think that just sets the pace and the standard for this season, but he had something more important that he wanted to do, so he did it, and kudos to him. I think that does touch on the mental game on this challenge. Now, some people come in with a specific reason, whether that's, I'm gonna win half a million dollars, or I'm doing this for my family, for for whatever reason that reason why you're out there always needs to be better than the pain and suffering that you're going through it always has to be worth it in your mind so it's so important on a very regular basis to reflect on why you're out there what's important what's driving you and to put yourself in that position where you're doing this for someone more than just yourself because it is so easy to help someone else and it is also really easy to give up on yourself and once you're on that train of thought where you're either thinking you're not worthy, you can't do it, then it kind of goes down that downward spiral. But if you truly want to be out there, in your mind, reflect and say, hey, can you do one hour more? Great, you do that one hour. Can you do another morning? Can you do another day? And keep upping the ante until you're always giving that 10% more, that one day more. And if you always align yourself with your mission, that is more important than yourself, I can see people going pretty far in this and in anything that they wanna pursue in life. All right, so that's it for Alone Season 9, Episode 2, Part 2. If you wanna see uh, comments on my drop and the things that they didn't show on TV and some of my little gear tips, check out Episode 2, Part 1. I'll put the link up here. And I also talk about some of the things that Terry and I go through on that Episode 2. Again, if anything sparks your interest on the medical side or the survival side, put it in the comments comments below and let me know if you want a longer more detailed video and if you are passionate about a particular topic whether you come from a hot environment or a cold environment and you want to understand the medicine behind it and get some formal education feel free to check out my field guide my upcoming online courses at www learnsurvivalmedicine.com. All my links to all the things that I used out there, my social media and all that, that's on www.survivaldoctors.com. Thank you for watching. I'll see you guys next time.